Well, we'll move you to move it. Floor is yours. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming. And, uh, after a long period of time, and it's always appreciated. It's always a challenge for any conference to have the first speaker after lunch. Where I can see the room is full of people. And that's very pleasant to see. And I hope that my presentation will be of interest to you. Now, let me first say my thanks, a uh, round of thanks, uh, to the organizers, uh, first of all, to Robert for inviting me here. And uh, in general, to the Andrei Zakhar Center. Uh, to other people who were involved uh, in organizing this event, setting it together and uh, finding, finding money for it as well, which is always a problem and a sheer challenge, so to all the donors. Uh, secondly, uh, let me say that I uh, uh, love being here in Lithuania. Uh, I actually haven't been in Lithuania for a long time, and uh, so that's uh, being here today was an opportunity, it is an opportunity still for me to to also spend some time in this beautiful country, beautiful city, uh, uh, seeing a lot of very nice people, open-minded, smiling a lot, and so on. So that's that's something. I'm sure Lithuanians uh, have their own share of problems uh, in front of them, but somehow many of them manage to smile a lot, and that's good. That means that people are probably having this optimistic or you know <laughs> activist uh, treats uh, in themselves, uh, and, that's, and that's great. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to say that uh, Sakharov name, Sakharov's name man, means a lot to me personally and uh, unfortunately it's young in Kledesh, so much not here yet, but uh, I would like to mention that I was growing up at the time when Sakharov's name became really known to a lot of people in the late years of former Soviet Union. <clears throat> I was a student in the history department uh, between uh, 1987 and 1992. And uh, that's exactly there in the late years of 1980s when uh, people like myself were glued to the TV screens and, and watching uh, this Congress of Deputies where Dmitry Dmitry was uh, taking part. And uh, of course, before that, I was always uh, interested as well in, uh, in, uh, in that personality. And uh, I remember in my household, we have been subscribing to the a magazine called the Chilovek is the poem, Man and the Law, which was a main uh, bashing outlet for both Andrei Dmitriyevich and Yelena Mona. And uh, I remember myself being a kid yet, a uh, high schooler at that point of time, reading those articles and wondering, like, why is that happening that uh, so much attention is given to this couple of all other people and why there is so much hatred and so much negativism? But then, of course, later on, I, I learned more about Anthony Dmitriyevich and his activities and his position. And, and I, his example has become a, a major example for me personally. And I think for my generation, in fact, for standing up for what is right, for keeping your conviction to the principles that you believe in, the values that you share. You know, and uh, I remember those episodes that we often see uh, in, uh, in videos or in, in, in photo materials when he is standing and everyone is, I mean, he's sitting uh, down and everyone is standing around him. Or indeed, what I was trying to just uh, stop him from talking and things like that. And that Afghanistan intervention, Afghanistan war again, uh, that was an eye-opening moment for a lot of us in the Soviet Union. You know, when suddenly someone comes in and says publicly on TV, on state TV, that the war is wrong and it's not going anywhere and we're losing. And uh, we've done pretty bad things there. So. Again, of course, it was a wake-up moment for a lot of people in the Soviet Union. And I, I, I don't think that uh, the war in Afghanistan was a major factor in the solution for the Soviet Union, but it contributed to some, to some extent. And of course, when people like Andrei Dmitriyevich started talking about this war, how unfair it is, uh, how ineffective it is, how cruel and, and, and bloody it is, uh, it actually was a major moment for many of us. And uh, definitely for me, who was very much interested in all the developments and already thinking about the field of studying international relations and things like that. So, yeah, it's a special honor for me to, to be here at the uh, Sakharov Conference and uh, I hope to be able to take part in events in the future organized by the Center. Uh, and uh, I also should mention, by the way, that uh, we are working today, already today for two plus years with uh, Vitautas Magnus University in Kaunas uh, in, uh, within the framework of uh, Erasmus project. Uh, which is called Rethinking uh, Regional Security Studies. Uh, we are talking about the 
security in this broader bulging black sea uh, region. Uh, so that's another opportunity for us to work with Lithuanian colleagues. But going back to the subject of Lithuania, Lithuania is a big friend of Ukraine. We know it really well. And that's, of course, for the recent five years, but even before that, even prior to that, Lithuania has always been a big friend. And uh, if you take sociological polls in Ukraine, who of the foreign leaders uh, you think is most supportive and the biggest friend of Ukraine, Lithuanian leaders are always at the top, and specifically with Dalia Vyboskaita in the recent years. Uh, she made major effort in supporting Ukraine, and we appreciate that. Because in Ukraine, of course, in the last five years we've been tested in many ways. It's been a very hard time. It's been a time of war, and crisis, and so on. And we've lost lives, thousands of lives in conflict. I'm going to talk about that in my presentation. And what matters a lot to us in Ukraine that we're not alone. We're seeing and receiving some support from other countries and civil society and just in general people uh, who are offering their support. And that's, that's a lot. That means a lot. So it's not just about financial assistance. It's not just about, let's say, uh, sending military or you know, weapons to the Ukrainian military or something like that. But that's appreciated too, but uh, quite often there's more, what is even more important is that we are not alone. You know, and even the journalists, when they talk to their soldiers, the train soldiers in the trenches in the bus, and they ask this question, like, what do you expect from the West? Uh, they often answer exactly that. We would like for us to see that uh, we are not left alone in that limbo, one-on-one -on -one conflict with Russia. Uh, we would like to be confident of the, the, of the fact that we are not uh, lost, abandoned, we're not forgotten about. Uh, which is unfortunately is actually happening in many ways uh, with the uh, Ukraine-Russia war. For, it's running for five years now, uh, and in many ways it is forgotten. All right, so that's a problem. Now let me switch to the subject of my presentation, which would be on uh, various uh, narratives uh, that have been used uh, by different sides in a discussion uh, uh, about Ukraine-Russia conflict, or should we say Russia-Ukraine conflict, because in my conviction, uh, Russia was the side that initiated the conflict. Um, the narratives that have been used often by Kremlin uh, and then uh, try to debunk them and provide you with alternative use of them. Uh, the narratives on the situation in Ukraine and around Ukraine is nothing new. Uh, they were coming from Moscow for a long time. Uh, I should say that uh, it's not just from the beginning of Euromaidan or the start of 2014. It started much, way, way, way before, much, way earlier. Uh, because I, I talk about that because it's often when you talk about this in Ukraine, I mean outside of Ukraine actually, the audience uh, tends to believe that this whole barrage of information warfare and propaganda started uh, then, in the spring of 2014, or maybe a little earlier when Euromaidan was taking place. That's not true. We've been under, living under the shower of Russian uh, fake news and myth-making and stereotypes and barrage of this news coming from Moscow for years and years before that. Definitely since the Orange Revolution, so-called Orange Revolution in 2004, or maybe even prior to that, because we remember the early 2000s, Putin coming to power and uh, quickly uh, deciding that uh, he should, as he says, bring Russia back from its knees, you know, whatever that means, and uh, become a more, uh, you know, pursue more assertive, aggressive policies. And that's what he did, and he saw a challenge of this thing, so-called color revolutions. Uh, in, you remember the times, the Serbia, Kyrgyzstan, and Georgia, and Ukraine, the Orange Revolution in our case, color revolutions, which definitely in Kremlin were seen as a major problem, as a challenge uh, that needs to be encountered. And uh, in countering this challenge, you need to employ the huge propaganda machine, which was then created, well-funded, well-oiled, they got the good people, smart people working there. That's another thing we need to remember. It's not just some group of uh, stupid clowns, uh, clones, uh, trolls or something. It's actually a lot of times uh, very smart people with Western degrees and knowing what they're doing. And this machine has been in work and been tested on Ukraine first of all. Well, I guess first of all was tested in Russians themselves, you know, to create a certain aura and atmosphere for the Putin regime. But then on Ukraine, and then now it's tasted, of course, uh, uh, very intensively on anyone else. As we've noticed in the last years, uh, this machine is working here and there, and there's interference in the public space, in the information space, in social media, in a variety of countries. I mean, we've all heard about Germany, we've heard about France, uh, you know, in the last days before Macron got elected to president. We've definitely heard about 2016 in the US. 
I mean, there is still debate among scholars how uh, influential and successful and effective was Russian interference in uh, U.S. elections, but before the elections, with uh, people reading uh, posts on Facebook posted by Russian agents and so on. Uh, there's debate, uh, and we can uh, still debate it, and there's no way, I think, to measure the actual uh, impact in numbers, all right? But the only thing when we hear that we know that, say, tens of millions of Americans read posts or information or articles or went to websites that were supported from Kremlin, uh, that's already telling you something. So that's a major, major contribution there. Uh, but going back to Ukraine, of course, Ukraine was uh, living under this uh, shower of this uh, information penetration into our information space, should I say. Uh, of course, uh, it was easier uh, for Russian uh, media machine or propaganda machine to work with Ukraine because a lot of people in Ukraine know Russian and uh, a lot of people in Ukraine, Russian is a native tongue as well. So, using uh, this information to uh, reach out to people in the east and south of Ukraine, which is predominantly Russian speaking, that what they were doing for years. I think it was quite a unique situation for years uh, when uh, uh, many Ukrainians were tuning in to Russian TV stations on a daily basis every evening instead of listening to uh, any TV stations, uh, you know, uh, carrying information from Kiev. So that's what it was, but of course 2014 was a major, major upscale, you know, this is major upgrade in activities, in intensity of the operation. Um, your Maidan happened first, of course, and we remember your Maidan, remember how a group of Ukrainian students went to the square to protest uh, then President Yanukovych's decision not to sign the cessation agreement with the European Union and how this particular episode was not the start of revolution of dignity or your Maidan revolution, but when the uh, students were uh, dispersed by uh, using unnecessary heavy police squads, special operation squads, uh, and uh, videos about this became known and seen everywhere around the world and in Ukraine. That's exactly what actually started the revolution of dignity and people remembered about all their uh, grievances and unhappiness that they had for years with the Yanukovych regime, which was a thuggish corrupt regime. And that's how all that created this uh, gasoline, really, uh, for, for the whole revolution. And that's, of course, when the Euromaidan was uh, portrayed already by many in Russia as, a, first of all, nationalist putsch or some kind of an uh, ultra-nationalist movement, even though it was a very diverse movement, of course, mostly peaceful. And, of course, in Russia you usually hear about Euromaidan that it was a violent, uh, you know, armed coup. In fact, uh, nothing of that, of that is true, you know, because it wasn't violent uh, until a certain moment. For the first couple of months of your Maidan, mostly, mostly non-violent, mostly peaceful, basically no arms. Uh, then it radicalized a little bit in, the, in, in re retaliation and the reaction to the government and the authority using force against the protesters. Uh, was it armed? That's again, that's another problem. I mean, on the other hand, you had the army of police, um, even at some point of time, dangerously close, you know, to Jim King to using uh, regular military forces against the protesters, luckily enough. That didn't happen, but uh, he was already moving in that direction, and some certain units were already called uh, into Kiev to do that. Uh, but you had thousands and thousands of heavily policed and uh, really well trained uh, uh, police officers in the streets on the one hand, and then you had mostly unarmed people with wooden shields and stuff like that, maybe some hunting rifles and stuff like that, but definitely uh, you could not call it a violent armed coup. Why Yankovic fled? in the late uh, days of February of 2014. That's still an open question. And that's an interesting question. And I find myself uh, this question under research uh, by our colleagues and scholars who are actually doing the research on domestic Ukrainian developments. Because, uh, like I said, I think it was pretty safe with all of this uh, security forces there in downtown Kyiv, not to mention that he's outside of Kyiv Dacha uh, Vila, where he basically lived. Um, and then he decided to start back and leave. So that's a big question, like what actually moved him, what, what, what actually pushed him towards leaving Ukraine. So that's another issue, but for Kremlin, of course, there was never a doubt in their propagation, propaganda campaign that this was an armed, violent coup and President Yanukovych was just scared for his life, and so he ran in, and so he found refuge in Russia. And I think that uh, in real life uh, he was needed already outside of Ukraine for Russia because that was a major pretext for violation of Ukrainian territorial integrity for, 
for Russians to go into Crimea. Uh, Yanukovych was much more useful at that point of time for Russia to be outside of Ukraine and in Russia as a political refugee, as a legitimate president which was deposed by quote unquote uh, 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 armed and coup. So that's uh, how that became a starting point in this information. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, the Euro Maidan, if you remember, just like the first Maidan in Ukraine ten years earlier, uh, were often portrayed as some kind of a coup orchestrated from outside of Ukraine. Uh, you know, mostly uh, the culprits that are mentioned are overseas and overseas in the US. Uh, there's no doubt about that, uh, because I think for them, for them, for the Russians, it's a major opponent and enemies in Washington, D.C. So to say that the coup was orchestrated, say, from London or Berlin, doesn't fly. It's not impressive. But when you say it's the State Department, when you say it's the CIA, when you say things like that, then, oh, okay, that, that we can believe in. And a lot of our Russians can believe in this, because they've been already exposed to this uh, negative information about, uh, you know, Americans going here and there, promoting democracy and changing regimes and stuff like that. Uh, so why not believe that the whole Euro Maidan thing was also an orchestrated operation, special operation uh, by CIA? There was a number of uh, funding, uh, the, the figure of funding uh, uh, by US towards Ukraine over years, often mentioned uh, usually 4.5 billion US dollars, but that's a number which includes all of the financial assistance that came from US to Ukraine over the years since 1991. And of course Ukraine was receiving a lot of Time was receiving a lot of assistance actually, being number three recipient on the list for the United States, uh, well behind Israel and Egypt, well, well above many other countries, including post Soviet countries, uh, in the numbers of assistance that we were receiving. So, but then, of course, in the Kremlin propaganda message, uh, this point, this figure 4.5, and, and it just travels from one uh, trope to another of, of, of Kremlin propagandists and uh, Kremlin friends in the West as well. Uh, it became a number which was paid a tri price tag for the revolution, for the coup, for deposing Yanukovych, who was friendly to Russia, and therefore, of course, the CIA decided that it's time to get rid of him. In fact, of course, uh, any, everyone in the West was pretty much causing, you know, calling for moderation, for nonviolence. Americans, for one thing, uh, they were uh, uh, really betting on this idea of uh, some kind of temporary technical government where opposition would be properly presented. And of course, uh, on the eve of Yanukovych fleeing from Kiev, you had uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Poland and Germany and France coming in and negotiating and uh, you know, mediating the signing of an agreement that would uh, leave Yanukovych in power for half a year longer and would call for snap elections later on in 2014. But then he left. And then another problem happened uh, with a Russian propaganda message machine sending another message. Okay, the violent armed coup happened, uh, uh, legitimate president is left, so who you have in place? You have imposters, you know, you basically have posers, you have people who don't have any legitimacy, they grab the power, the deserters. Uh, on, the, on the contrary, I mean, the situation when Yanukovych you know, left, uh, so there was no impeachment, and actually in all Ukrainian law there is no clear clause for the impeachment, but what do you do if suddenly one day you wake up, I remember the Saturday morning, and we are waking up and we are finding out that Yanukovych is not there. No one knows where he is. And later on, a little later on, we found out that he's in Russia already, uh, including signing letters, presumably, and then I think uh, originals of that letter have appeared later on, of calling uh, for Russia to send troops to, you know, to defend Russians, epic Russians and Russian speakers, specifically in Crimea, against this Ukrainian you know, nationalists and fascists. So what do you do if you're Ukrainian political class? You know, you have a president who's abandoning his position. Right, who went to the AWOL, so he's not there, he's missing in action. I mean, where is he? So someone has to run the country. And according to many Ukrainian rules, you had legitimate parliament, which was legitimately elected by Ukrainians, which took power as a temporary, transitionary uh, governing force. And none of them, uh, including those people who came to power when Yanukovych left, have said, okay, we are the rulers of this country now from now on now uh, on, you know, for the coming years. No, they said we're going to have, in two months from now, we're going to have elections, all right? We're going to elect, uh, part, we're going to elect a new president, and free and fair elections. We're going to elect a little later, in the fall of 2014, we're going to elect the parliament. So for now, we need to run, we need to act, we need to rule the country, because someone has to be in charge, all right? Someone has to pay pensions, someone has to take care of basic uh, uh, civil control and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's again, you know, 
uh, the question of, uh, which was often used by Russian propaganda, Russian promise, United Nations and so on, like the, the new government was illegitimate. How it was illegitimate if all the people were there only temporarily until the elections and they were all elected uh, to their positions by Ukrainian people in illegitimate Ukrainian elections. So, then another question, of course, becomes for us political scientists to debate sometimes like, do you lose your legitimacy when you use force against your people? That's another thing, you know. If you legitimately elected in three or fair elections, doesn't mean that from that point on you can do whatever you like to the, your own citizens, your own uh, citizens, people in your country. Can you use force? Can you, you know, just shoot unarmed people like the Heavenly Hundred was shoot, uh, uh, shot at the Maidan? So I guess the answer is no. So, but that's a big debate. You know, that's a, that's a sovereignty of the country versus. Uh, the, the, the duty of international community to intervene in cases when you have a tyrannic, despotic uh, ruler who kills her, his own uh, people, her own people. That's a big debate, but one of the biggest that you have in the field of international relations today. So, on the one hand, you have this, uh, uh, not just responsibility, but duty to intervene, and on the other hand, you have this territorial integrity and uh, sovereignty. And, uh, so, you know, you can use it to, to debate Assad and others and so on, but also Ukraine. So that particular case, uh, of course, uh, Ukraine was founding itself in a difficult situation already, wounded, uh, fragile, unstable, when Yanukovych fled, uh, the Yurumadan just uh, was over, the uh, country was already uh, in, in blood, uh, you know, full in blood because of the shootings at the Maidan. Uh, it was a very volatile situation and that's when Russia decided, of course, to move in with Crimea and a little later on with Donbass. So, that's another thing I would like to articulate here strongly, and it's my position that a lot of times in the West, people see clear cause-effect, uh, cause-consequence kind of sequence there between the Euromaidan on the one hand and then Crimea and Donbass on the other. And I don't think that's true. Uh, we have Euromaidan, but we felt that it's over and we should just start a new era and new, new chapter in the life of our country. But then. Again, uh, Russia has chosen deliberately to use the moment when Ukraine is most unprepared and, and, and fragile and imprudent and incompetent, inconfident in itself and move in. On Crimea, there's a little doubt. I mean, I don't, don't think that there's a proof yet, but it might appear in the coming years, uh, of the Crimean plan of intervention, of annexation being there for years. But I think there's a lot of reasons for us to believe that the whole plan was there for a while just looking for the right moment and uh, the moment was found when uh, you have armed coup, when you have legitimate president deposed, when you have, we're getting to another major narrative, uh, uh, you know, kind of joker card for, 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 for the Russian propaganda machine, when you have Russian ethnic Russians and ethnic Russian speakers are persecuted or indiscriminated or in danger. Because of course when they moved into Crimea they said that the Ukrainian nationalists are preparing a bloodshed, you know, it's going to be a massacre. You know, this uh, mythical, most of the times, Ukrainian nationalists, heavily armed, they're going to Crimea, they're going to just shed a lot of blood. So that's what's going to happen unless we come in and protect the ethnic Russian, Russian speaking population. Which was, of course, a major BS because nothing of that sort was, was, was happening, was in the works. None of the Ukrainian uh, regular uh, units was preparing that, none of the Ukrainian nationalists or activists were preparing any of them or capable of that uh, uh, at, at the moment. All right? They were all preoccupied with your Maidan, which just, was just ended. So everyone was focused on developments in Kyiv and emergence of a new political situation. And uh, so no one really was thinking about going to Crimea to kill some ethnic like, Russians and, and Russian speakers. But then again, uh, this uh, narrative has been there uh, ever since that uh, in Ukraine you have ethnic Russians and you have Russian speakers in danger and therefore we, Moscow, we have to protect these people. Never mind that uh, they are not really in danger, never mind that a lot of these people never ask for any Russian protection. Uh, I'm a Russian speaking person myself, I come from Odessa, it's a Russian speaking city. Uh, most of my friends, most of my colleagues are Russian speaking, uh, many of them ethnic Russians. Uh, very, very few of them were actually among those who would say, okay, let's, uh, let's hope that Russia intervenes and Putin comes in with his tanks and protects us. Because we were quite sure of the fact that there was never a danger. In fact, the whole Ukrainization business that we're having for years now is a very slow, very soft, you know, it's a difficult situation. Sometimes it's a dilemma, you know, you're basically protecting the rights of Ukrainian speakers 
uh, do you do it at the expense of people speaking other languages? That's an open question. That's a painful, delicate question that one needs to answer. But uh, for the people who are Ukrainian speakers today, or people who are reading Ukrainian books, or would like to see Ukrainian movies, they are, in real life, who are discriminated in Ukraine for years. Because the number of books in Ukraine is very little, number of movies, very few. You know, if you go to the shop, and say you, are, or you ask a question, uh, you know, from a clerk, shop clerk, in Ukrainian, uh, there is a high chance that you might not be understood or you might receive an answer in, in, in Russian. Uh, and that's a problem. So many of our Ukrainization efforts are directed, aimed exactly at defending Ukrainian language, which was basically on the verge of extinction, uh, historically. There have been very few points, quite few points. I mean, in Ukrainian history, when Ukrainian language, Ukrainian culture was close to extinction, but it survived, and now we want to uh, ensure its uh, survival for the future, so that's what we're doing. But definitely no one is forbidding us to use language, the Russian language, we use it. I mean, in my university I even teach in Russian. I'm a very pro ukrainian person, you know, but I teach in Russian. Most of my colleagues do the same. Why? Because it's our native tongue, most of our students are from Odessa, so they're Russian-speaking kids. It just makes more sense, common sense, I would say, in practical life. Uh, than to teach you in Russian, we can do it in Ukrainian, we'll probably switch eventually to Ukrainian. But I'm giving this example not because I'm proud of that, that I'm teaching in Russian, uh, being a pro ukrainian person, but as an example of no persecution taking place, no discrimination is happening, nothing of that sort. You know, the whole, all the old rumors, recent rumors now that there will be a language police, that people will go after you if you use Russian language in the streets, that's complete, uh, again, complete piece of BS, another piece of BS really there. So. So that's, that's a problem there, and, but they're continuing to peddle that troll and continuing to peddle this, that stereotype. Now, of course, Crimea happened in Ukraine at that point of time, as you just remember, decided not to fight back. Uh, the country was weak, there was no, uh, you know, there was no coherence, there was discussion, heated discussion. We now have the archives and minutes of the meetings in Kyiv, people deciding what we do uh, in the light of what Russia is doing in Crimea. Uh, we didn't have any warnings uh, from our friends in the West, uh, including uh, Apparently, almighty American uh, intelligence, uh, which instigated the coup in Kiev, but they were not capable of predicting well in advance what Russians are doing in Crimea. So, even, even the CIA, actually, and other intelligence community organizations in the US only find out about the special operation in session in Crimea maybe like a couple of days before the Russians actually pulled it off. And the message was coming to us from the West, of course, that you shouldn't fight because uh, you, you would lose, first of all, there would be a lot of blood. And second of all, Russia probably use it as a, to escalate the conflict and there will be a military invasion of larger scale. And uh, there was an, a lesson of Georgia of 2008 in front of us as well, before our eyes, when uh, Saakashvili decided to retaliate for the Russian military provocations and he was punished by the, 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 the escalation and the intervention of Russian troops back in August 2008. So that lesson worked and a message coming from DC and elsewhere, a uh, very strong message, don't fight please, we are with you, we are going to help you through it. But let it go, don't fight. And the uh, Ukrainian leadership at that point of time decided not to. And there is a debate still in Ukraine, I think there will be debate for the coming years. Was a, this a right decision? Was this a moral decision? You know, wasn't it a natural thing to do to fight back when your territorial integrity is violated and you see your military units surrounded by some people without insignia, this little green man? You know, isn't it natural if you're a leader of Ukraine, even a temporary leader, to, to, to make an order, to give an order to fight back? It's an open question. But the, 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 the logic of thinking back then in Ukraine, of course, was that we shouldn't fight back. Uh, and they would probably leave us alone, which was, of course, uh, very quickly. It turned out not to be true, because Donbass followed, uh, obviously. Uh, you know, Donbass followed also, because uh, we might think, uh, because Russia, Ukraine didn't fight back in Crimea. Uh, so Putin said, okay, fine, if they're not fighting there, why not open another front? Another front? There is more connection between uh, Donbass and, and Crimea. One of them, uh, those connections being made by a lot of uh, experts is that uh, uh, Putin also opened the front in Donbass to, to get attention away from Crimea. So right now the whole negotiation process is focused on Donbass and everyone's bringing or taking the uh, Crimean issue out of the brackets. And that's what Putin wants, all right? So maybe in the future he would give up on Donbass. There is an opportunity, there is a possibility of that. Uh, but not in Crimea, and therefore he would say, okay, you want Donbass back, but maybe tacitly, if you're Ukraine and Ukraine's friends from the West, uh, acknowledge and give, give, give your claims on, on Crimea up. 
So that's a big issue there as well. So what happened in Donbass and what's happening in Donbass still? Uh, I think definition matters. Well, sometimes when I hear how, how all this block of events that are happening there since April, May of 2014 are, are called, I immediately know <laughs> the position of the Austrian. <laughs> uh, you know, is it a Ukrainian conflict? Is it conflict in Ukraine? Is it Eastern Ukraine conflict? Or is it Ukraine-Russia conflict? You know, that, that, that matters, because uh, technically it's happening in Eastern Ukraine. There is no other battlefronts. We're not waging war in territory of Russia, right? not in the Stoff region, for instance. Yes, in Don, Donetsk and Luhansk uh, oblast regions, yes. So technically it happens there. But when you say the conflict in Ukraine, or Ukrainian conflict, or something like that, not even the Ukraine conflict, you immediately hint that this is a domestic conflict, this is a quarrel between different groups of people in Ukraine, uh, different groups, uh, you know, different political groupings, uh, different armed groups, and so on. Uh, sometimes you hear in the news here in the West, the fighting is between, say, one side and uh, the units, military units loyal to the Kiev, or something like that. You know, that's like, seriously, we're talking about the armed forces of the country yeah, that are called, that are, that are there for this only purpose to defend the territorial integrity against the foreign attack, against external attack. But yet, somehow, sometimes journalists in various countries manage in their news coverage to call them pro Kiev units or units loyal to Kiev, something like that. So that's really strange, and, but uh, what is happening is an interstate conflict, obviously. Uh, in that respect, it's another issue uh, for us to debate how do we call it. Uh, it's the Ukraine-Russia war, the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Initially, early on, I think it was a crisis. A lot of people actually stuck to the crisis war for too long, in my way, in my, uh, for, too, for too long, in my understanding, in my opinion. Uh, you know, you have a crisis, maybe, but then when you have uh, heavy fighting for a long time, months and now years, you know, is it a crisis really? It's a war. It's a hot war, it's an ongoing conflict. Uh, you know, it happens as we speak. You know, we see, in, it's very open conflict in Ukraine, that's another thing. We see the, the, the faces of people who died yesterday, day before yesterday, every day, on social media. So unlike for the Russia, uh, this is a very open conflict. In Russia, of course, you know, we're not there. That's their position. You know, but in Ukraine, it's a very open conflict. So that's a problem. It has a toll on Ukrainian society. Uh, it is a conflict, it is uh, what some experts call a delayed war for independence. Uh, that's another way to look at it, because of course Ukraine got its independence uh, in a peaceful manner back then in 1991. Uh, uh, there were some conflicts, as you know, and still uh, brewing, uh, so-called frozen conflicts, uh, all over former Soviet Union, but not in Ukraine for a while. And actually we praised ourselves that we are standing there in this volatile, unstable, Russian stability area, where you have Transnistria, next door you have Balkans, and then you have Caucasus, and just across the sea you have Kurds and Middle East, and all of a sudden you have this island of stability and, and security, which is Ukraine, nothing's happening, no unrest, no conflicts uh, of any nature. We praised ourselves until that conflict was brought to our door, to our threshold. So that's definitely uh, the conflict which is imposed on Ukraine, forced on, forced on Ukraine. Uh, the whole notion of civil war that some people, including some of our colleagues in the West, you know, are trying to revive now. This day. Like, uh, you know, recently was an attempt by one distinguished scholar in the West to, uh, he wrote a memo, uh, you know, basically advocating this point that uh, what if we just uh, pretend it is a civil war for, for the matter of discussion, you know, and for the matter of us bringing the possibility of Ukraine-Russian reconciliation. Uh, specifically with applied angle, you know, would it be useful? Would it be productive? Uh, yeah, I don't think, I don't think so. I don't think so because that's not uh, what is going on, all right? That's, uh, that's not a civil war. Yes, you have a bunch of Ukrainians on the one hand shooting at some other Ukrainians on the other hand, but the conflict is externally driven. You know, these people who are shooting at Ukrainian troops they were funded by Russia, they were trained by Russia, they were first brainwashed by Russian propaganda, the convoys are coming through the border that Ukraine doesn't control. So, the newest uh, types of military equipment that Ru Russian military labs have produced in the recent years have been founded in Donbass. There is more tanks at Luhansk and Donetsk, so poor people's republic sometimes than people calculate more tanks there than with some major military powers in Western Europe. So, so that's another thing. And then, of course, to conclude, because I only have a few, few minutes left, uh, uh, 
how do we call these people who are fighting in Ukraine? That's another issue. Uh, you know, uh, do we call them rebels, separatists, insurgents, militants? Uh, was a listen, recently it was a scandal because it was a debate and President uh, Zelensky, who was the point of one candidate, Zelensky, he called them rebels. Uh, all right, and that caused a lot of steer in Ukraine. I prefer to call them Russian proxies, but, but that's uh, my own uh, approach to that particular issue. So, most finally, I would like to say that, uh, of course, uh, uh, media coverage plays a lot of big role, big role. So, what we face a lot of times is a so-called balanced coverage, which means that you have an expert on Ukraine on one hand, and then some obscure personality without any experience in the region. Uh, but he's called in the studio just because he would, she would uh, advocate something different to the mainstream consensus. Uh, expertise-based uh, point of view. That's called they call it balanced coverage. There was another example. Like if you if you if you wonder if there's rain on, on the street right now as we speak, you go out and you see if it rains or not. You don't make guesses, all right? But that's exactly what is happening. You have complete strangers in studios. Uh, Peter Pomeranzov wrote this major seminal book uh, explaining how the world works. And nothing is true and everything is possible. Then other scholars join in, and that's major major uh, field of studies right now. They're trying to confuse people, you know, so they're trying to uh, uh, spell the message that everyone's lying, it's not just us. So don't blame Russia, to, Russia today, CNN is bad too, BBC is bad too, Russia today is just like CNN. So uh, aren't they following state policies, CNN, BBC and others? You know, so it's not just Russia today, so that, that's what they're trying to do, the question more thing. The pedal conspiracy theories, they, they, they base what they're doing on alternative facts, so that's uh, Interesting, what has been used in Ukraine and against Ukraine now is being used heavily against a lot of other countries with many other major uh, dimensions there. Uh, we did block TV channels, it was mentioned already today. Uh, it was a controversial move, but it actually worked because a lot of Ukrainians stopped watching this Russian propaganda on a daily basis and they, maybe reluctantly, but they started watching Ukrainian TV uh, news coverage, so the, which was already a positive development. So, I would like uh, to close here so that we have at least some time for the questions and answers. Thank you. Very lucid and enlightening deconstruction of the, the Russian propaganda. Can I just take you back to what you were saying about the Euromaidan right. and the fact that it was very largely peaceful? But of course, at the end, there was a small minority of the protesters who did use force. Right notably the Ravi sect, right, the right sector. Mm -hmm. And then I remember even after Europe my the Ravi sector got involved in certain incidents mm -hmm. in Donbass mm -hmm. and in Western Ukraine where they seemed to be stirring up trouble. Mm -hmm. And it left the question in my mind, were Pravi sector actually a Russian provocation all along? Yeah. Uh, there is a such a theory in Ukraine that some of the most uh, far-right uh, Ukrainian organizations are actually somehow supported from Moscow. Uh, with Maidan, uh, with the first part of your question, I think they've never been a major force. And uh, the, any retaliation with weapons uh, that we saw there was already retaliation for the violence from the government side and the soldiers side. Uh, and people were using hunting rifles and stuff like that. So people were fed up, like they're killing other people with impunity and we need to fight back, so that's it. And, uh, and what my main message was that this kind of a few guns uh, on the hands of protesters wasn't a major force to force Yanukovych to flee. So that's one thing. But with the provocations in the little bus, I don't think so. Yeah, I, don't, I think what I saw, what I remember, what I recall, was already a special operation, Russian special operation in the because if you see those videos, you know, you see how those people behave, those are not local militias. No. They have very good training. They were taken over government buildings, police precincts, and so on. Uh, the way they talk, you know, we have a lot of videos there. It's a funny thing, they use Russian lang language there, they use words that are not used in the Russian speaking parts of Ukraine, and so on. So, I mean, whatever promise sector did there, they came up then as a volunteer battalion later on and they fought on the front line like many others did. You know, of course we have some nationalists, that's another thing. You know, actually for the country which is in war, a major war against a bigger, bigger enemy, asymmetric conflict, which is a huge enemy there, we have too little of nationalism, frankly. You know, that's another problem that I have with our nationalists being a liberal person. If why, instead of fighting the war in, uh, against the Russian Donbass, they are focusing on the LGBT community or, 
or left-wing organizations, that's a big problem in Ukraine as well, but if you're really patriots, if you're really nationalists, why don't you focus on this major fight that we have this, with this bigger bear <laughs> next door to us? But that's an open question. Thank you for your interesting analysis. And I have a question. If we look more broadly, don't you think that it's a conflict between Russia and the West? Right. Actually, war between right. Russia and the West, only yeah. fought on yes. Ukraine's territory. As you rightly noticed, conflict was imposed. Right. And basically, it looks that Russia was testing the limits, right. how far yes. it should go. Yeah. It got them punished after Georgia. Right. Now it trying yeah. much, much bigger, yeah. much bigger thing. Right. 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 It's a very good point. It's a very good point. Uh, first of all, since you mentioned Georgia, I remember again, August 2008, Everyone said Russia is going to support the Pazia Sassasitia, but that's it. They would never venture into Russia, into Georgia proper, but then they did. And then later on people said, okay, that's Georgia, small. I mean, it's, it's unthinkable to think about Russia intervention to Ukraine. And then they did. So again, every, any time today when someone says, but uh, no, no, that's unthinkable. How can we think about Russia using force, say, against uh, Lithuania or Estonia or Romania or something? That's not going to happen. Yeah, let's think again. I mean, what, did, 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 did history teach you anything? Mm -hmm. And not just the recent five years, but maybe a longer period of time if you go back in history. Yeah, I mean, nothing is impossible, unfortunately. And he is testing the West, the patience of the West, and he's trying to get away. Putin, I mean, he's uh, trying to outweigh the West. Uh, he's probably prepared for some sanctions. I think uh, that the sanctions are running for a long time now is uh, something that he wasn't prepared for, that is some kind of an unpleasant surprise for the Russian political elite, but, but anyhow, he was prepared, and uh, I think that uh, he might uh, actually engage in some act of hostility against the EU member country or NATO country just to show that he can do it, and that he's a major power in the region, and that NATO can do anything to help you. And frankly, NATO, of course, was awakened, that's another issue of interest, uh, woke up after this events and basically had a second life for themselves because they were questioning their mission and function already for a while, but now they know why. <laughs> and uh, they're doing more uh, with regards to the Baltic region, much less actually with, to, with regards to my uh, corner of the world, the Lexi region. That's exactly where annexation of Crimea happened, but somehow NATO is much slower in coming up with solutions in the Lexi region comparing to what they're doing with patrols and rotations and so on here in the Baltic region. So yes, it's a message to the West, and Putin says so, yeah, yeah we, we can, we, we're giving you know, the big middle fingers to the West, that's our uh, sphere of influence, and there are a lot of buyers of this uh, theory in the West who are saying yes, but Russia is just, I mean, Ukraine is just unfortunate to be next door to, to Ukraine, people like John Mearsheimer, they say, who, can, who, who cares what Ukraine has said, you know, they don't have any agency, we should talk directly to Moscow and decide the future of Ukraine, we neutralize, Finlandize, do something to it, but it's not a good thing. We should we will try to go back to business with, as usual with Russia. That's our priority if you're in the West. That we, we're going to you know, build Nord Stream 2. We're going to bring Russia back into the Council of Europe, despite them not addressing any of the concerns that led for their, for, to their exclusion of the Council of Europe to start with. So unfortunately, there are a lot of buyers. And Putin having this strategic patience. There was a lot of talk about strategic patience on Obama's part at some point of time as an expert, but in fact the one who is having the strategic patience is, is Putin, it's Kremlin. Yeah. Okay, last question? Yeah. So my name is Gana Dudinska, I'm from Ukraine as well, and I would like to thank you for your amazing presentation and for your reflection, especially thank someone you. who personally comes from Donetsk. Oh, okay. So it's, it was very good, thank you. And my question is, you have mentioned the so-called Crimea plan, do you think there was also a plan from Donbass, keeping in mind yeah. this propaganda yeah. campaign lasting right. for decades as right. well? And the second question is about the decree recently issued by Putin, which proposes mm. a simplified procedure for passports for the residents of so-called republics. Right. Do you think it's kind of um, just an action to destabilize Ukraine in the light of elections, or is it also a well-prepared action to justify annexation yeah. in the future? Two great questions, actually. Uh, so the second one on passports, and the first one on... Uh, plan for the yeah, plan for the bus. Uh, I, I don't think so that they had a uh, more or less elaborated plan for Donbass, unlike with Crimea, because Crimea was always very important, right, and, uh, and they were preparing for that, I think. Uh, they had maybe even several drafts of the plan, like what we do if, what we do if, and, and how we do it. Um, and that's a speculation, I mean, there is no proof, we don't get to archives to see 
if there is a, such a thing. With Don Bass, it was, I think, more of an improvisation. And, like, first of all, they were emboldened by how easily they got away with Crimea. Uh, second of all, they said, okay, well, let's open this another front, and that would be useful for us anyway. But having said that, I also heard from my friends from Donbass who had to leave Donbass uh, since 2014. Uh, they said there was amazing uh, slippers uh, network uh, in Donbass. Uh, they saw people in little towns who on the second day of uh, invasion really became leaders of their units right away and they knew everyone around them and they went straight to the point of meetings uh, and they had plans how to work together. So, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's not, not enough. I mean, that's just people telling you know, hearsay, you know, people telling stories. But maybe eventually we'll find out how Donbass was well prepared. But definitely there were activists uh, in the region, pro-Russian activist radicals, who were ready to act. Uh, they were also in Kharkiv and in Odessa. In Odessa, of course, we had May 2nd event in 2014, mm -hmm. which was again portrayed by Russian propaganda as a bunch of Ukrainian Nazis uh, burning people alive on purpose which in fact was quite contrary. It was the pro-Russian radicals who attacked the Ukrainian peaceful rally. They fought back. I mean, they miscalculated the balance of power and relation of forces in the city. So they were heavily outnumbered within several hours. And then there was a fire, which they started as well, because they were throwing a lot of cocktails. Other sides were thrown them as well. I know the building well, but the whole happened. They barricaded themselves. They died from smoke inflammation. That's what happened, all right? But then, of course, ever since May 2nd, 2014, that's also a major rallying cry for Russian volunteers to come and fight in Donbass, but also a lot of left-wing kind of people around the globe. I saw people on May 2nd in Toronto laying flowers uh, in memory of those people who were killed by Ukrainian Nazis. I saw in, in Genoa the railway station a huge banner on May 2nd, remember May 2nd in Italian. So that became a major far-left rallying cry as well, so that's interesting. Um, but partisanization, uh, I think Putin is uh, sending this triangle ball, he's testing the water, uh, he's not losing much by this proposition, he's testing the new government, the new president, I mean, of Ukraine, uh, they issue more passports, that's good anyway, if Donbass returns to Ukraine, that's fine, we have more Russian citizens that we have to defend, to protect, you know, from Kyiv if needed. Uh, if it doesn't go back to Ukraine, that's easier for us to, you know, to incorporate Donbass into Russia, if we think so. Uh, if we think that's, that's needed. And, and again, this whole thing tested in Transnistria and in Abkhazia, in South City as well. Right. Thank you. Right,